Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Neuroscience and Education webinar series on Closing the Gap for Historically Underperforming Students. Our session will be starting in just a few minutes. Before we get to it, I want to just give you a, few, a little bit of information about how this will work. You're being placed on mute as you enter the room if you call in. Otherwise, you're just listening to the audio broadcast. The session is being recorded, so if you need to leave early or you know someone that you would like to um, listen to it later, that will be available in about a week's time. If you have questions during the session, you're welcome to use the Q&A area or the chat area that is to the right of the screen. As soon as I share my screen, that will be available to you at the bottom of your screen. If you just put your mouse down there, it'll, it'll pop up and you can find it. So while I go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to now invite my colleague Betsy to go ahead and get started. Um, hello everybody and um, this is Betsy Hill, president of um, Brainware Safari and Sarah Sotel who gave us all of our instructions about how we're to find the chat and the Q&A and all that kind of thing. And we're delighted that you can join us this afternoon for our webinar. Um, another thing that we can let you know is that we will be happy to provide a copy of the slides that we're using today. So if you have signed in with your email address, you will get it automatically. If you are watching with somebody else or just want to make sure you get a copy, uh, we will provide our email addresses at the end. So let's get started. We have an ambitious agenda today because we want to talk about three different groups of students. And the reason that we want to talk about them all together is for a couple of reasons. One is that um, there are a lot of new accountability measures that um, suggest that we ought to be looking at them as a, um, as a single group. And also because there are a variety of common underlying cognitive processes that can impede or enhance progress uh, academically for all three groups. Um, and that what we're going to be doing in the process is talking about how we can help develop those underlying skills using Brainware, Brainware Safari and how that will impact um, academic progress. So what I have here is an example of the kind of thing that is happening um, in various states around the country. This is a snapshot of part of the Pennsylvania performance, school performance profile calculation. And what this um, profile does is um, institute a process in which um, this performance profile will account for 15% of principal and teacher evaluations and can also have an impact on superintendent evaluations as well. What you see with the little red arrow pointing to it is the measure that Pennsylvania and many other states are now being faced with for the first time, which is closing the achievement gap for um, historically low-performing students. And that what that includes is um, three groups of students, disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged, English language learners, and special ed all combined together. And um, as we talk to school districts around the country, what we see is that even districts who have been performing well in the past are having to refocus their efforts because of this category and this combination of the three um, groups together is often referred to as a super group or a super subgroup. So if you hear that ter terminology, that's what that refers to. And the next slide shows an example of just such a district in Wisconsin. Um, the district name has been removed, but um, this is a district that has been very high performing for many years. You can see that they rank much better than the state average. If you look on the upper right in reading achievement and math achievement, they rank quite a bit higher than the state average in student achievement as well as in student growth. But their progress in closing the gaps for this, what is called there, the supergroup of ELL, special ed, and economically disadvantaged students um, has a, had a significant impact on their overall rating. And so they are now paying a much closer attention to this. And I imagine that it's not going to be much of a surprise um, it will be hard to convince you that the gap between average performance for students in general um, and the three categories we're discussing today is pretty large. And what the next slide shows is um, state-level data from uh, Pennsylvania. And this is just 
as an example, I'm going to talk about, show you here a couple of states, but the, basically the pattern is the same through all of them. And what you see here is um, the number of students participate, or the percentage of students, rather, who um, took the test, which is the, state, the Pennsylvania State um, Standardized Assessment, who are performing at the basic level and below. And you can see the level for all students, and then a higher proportion of students in those three categories um, per not performing as well, or perf having more students in the basic and below category. That's the case is reading, and the case is math, um, and with even a, you know the biggest disparities in reading. Um, because I showed you Wisconsin, I decided to just pull some data from Wisconsin. Um, in Wisconsin, there are a very high percentage of students who are not reaching the proficient level, who are performing at that basic and below level. And um, what really struck me as I looked at this is an alarming 90% of fourth grade ELL students are reading only at a basic level or below. So the pattern is basically the same. Um, the gaps are basically the same as we have seen um, in Pennsylvania. And then having picked an eastern state and a midwestern state, I decided I would travel out to the west coast and pulled some data from California. And of course, not surprisingly, the pattern is basically the same here. Um, and what you're seeing here is, again, fourth grade performance on math and reading, showing the gap between where students in general are performing and those who are either low socioeconomic status, ELL, or um, in this case have a disability. Now, um, I also wanted to just quickly address the question is that these gaps, um, which we've seen at fourth grade, um, actually tend to get worse in a lot of cases um, to, to widen over time. So I don't really want to belabor the point, but what the next slide shows is um, just an example from Pennsylvania, which shows eighth grade versus fourth grade performance. And as you can see in um, math, the performance actually deteriorates. You've got more students performing in the basic and below category, a little bit of improvement in reading, um, except for the students with IEPs. Uh, but the gap really remains, and um, so it's not something that's being helped over time. So what we're going to do today is take the perspective that we always take, which is what we now know and understand about the brains of our students. Um, each of us is born with a brains with 150 to 200 million neurons, and our brains develop and learn by creating trillions of connections among those neurons. And while some of that is gro uh, growth is guided by genetics, the environment is much more than incidental. And it's specifically our interaction, our brain's interactions with our environment that causes our brains to grow and develop. And so we're going to start off by exploring brain development for some of our economically disadvantaged students. Um, the nature of the environment in which we grow up has tremendous implications. And what you're seeing here is a CT scan of the brain of a normal child and one who has suffered extreme neglect. In this case, even the size of the brain has been affected. And of course, it's much more than the, about the size of the brain, uh, but I, and I also want to emphasize that this is extreme neglect. But as we will see, we really have to consider the likelihood that children from disadvantaged backgrounds have not experienced the same kinds of richness in their environment and that therefore the development of their brains has not occurred in the same ways or in the same pace. And as we'll see on the next slide, that is in fact the case. Um, there's some fascinating research uh, by Kimberly Noble, uh, who is now at Columbia University Medical Center. And this research was something that she conducted when she was at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. And what her research shows is um, deficits across multiple brain systems for low socioeconomic status students. And this is really important because we have known for many years about um, vocabulary and language deficits. That was identified, um, I think, a couple of decades ago now by Hart and Risley. But what this research says is that it's not just about whether or not we've heard three million or these students have heard three million fewer words by the time they're three. These are deficits in terms of the lack of development that impact brain system by brain system. And 
what we're going to talk about now is not just about identifying the parts of the brain that have not developed as fully, but understanding the connection uh, and the impact on those students who might have less capacity um, because they haven't been able to develop some skills essential to the learning process. So the three examples that we're going to take a look at are perceiving patterns and visualizing, which is our occipitotemporal visual system, and controlling the focus of our attention, which is our, our executive prefrontal cortex, and retaining information, which is lateral prefrontal and the working memory system. So if we sort of take those and try to connect them to the kinds of things that we might see in a classroom from students um, who are low SES or economically disadvantaged, um, Perceiving patterns and visualizing, some examples would be a, a variety of nonverbal cognition tasks. So they m might have greater difficulty organizing their physical or their mental workspace. Uh, they might have um, difficulty um, understanding nonverbal feedback in a social situation. Um, math and science concepts that require visualization or keeping things in a column or uh, those kinds of visual spatial skills may be a challenging um, area for them. Um, when it comes to controlling the focus of one's attention, um, and we see plenty of kids, not just low SES, who have issues controlling the focus of their attention, um, but we may see this um, from this uh, group of students, the ability to stay on task, to defer gratification, to come with a strategy or a plan for something, to make a decision, all of these kinds of things um, can be very challenging. And are the uh, examples of things they may not have as mu had as much experience um, doing. And then the final example, working memory, um, being able to retain information and manipulate it, essential for complex reasoning, essential for problem solving, a key part of reading comprehension, in fact, is involved very intensively in a whole variety of learning functions. So hopefully that helps to connect to the kinds of things that we that these kids might struggle with in a classroom learning situation. And um, I think it's important to say that um, the message is that low SES students come into our classrooms, not all of them, but on average, um, different in terms of some of the mental processes involved in learning. And even with good teaching and a safe environment, it will still take them longer to learn what they must to survive and thrive in an academic setting because they haven't had an opportunity to develop those skills. But the punchline is the most important. The very plasticity that developed their brains the way that they did can be harnessed to overcome those initial deficits. Students with less cognitive ability, from whatever reason, and this will become relevant also when we talk about ELL students and um, students with uh, learning disabilities, um, can still develop it. Uh, plasticity does, in fact, rule. And Sarah is going to now take over, and we'll show you exactly how that can happen. This is usually when I like to lead a cheer, but since we're not all in the same room, I can't get you started on yelling the plasticity rules cheer. But you can keep that going on in your head because that's really what this is all about. The really closing the gap, the things we've done in the past haven't worked as educators, and but that can be done. And we can see now some direct neuroscience evidence that there are. It's not just that they they are struggling with their reading; that there are some real reasons why. And so what you're seeing here is research that was done with some low SES students in Indianapolis. And these, uh, these are fourth and fifth grade boys, and what you're looking at is the red line is their age. So they're pretty much around the same age, between 9 and, and 14. And yes, that means there's some 13 and 14 year olds in, in um, fifth grade. And one of the things that, that you can see here is the blue bars are the individual students, and that's their average cognitive functioning. And you can see how significantly below their age their cognitive abilities really are. And then what we did was we actually put them through an intervention, Brainware Safari. And Brainware is designed to develop 41 cognitive skills that are critical for our ability to learn. It's comprehensive, it's integrative, it works the way our brains work. It's grounded in, in what we know about how our brains and the way our plasticity can be 
used to close those deficits and make them less of a barrier, and it's derived from clinical therapy, the best practices. It's a video game. The kids love to play it, and all it requires is an intervention that's about a semester long, 10 to 14 weeks, 30 minutes at a time, three to five times a week. And this particular group of students did it in their classrooms with their teachers as their coaches. The coaches um, vowed to do it for 12 weeks, five times a week for at least 30 minutes. And what they did was they, they did that on purpose so that when there were times when they couldn't get it in um, and they got three times a week, they were really excited. And if there was a time when they got less than that, they made sure they got those five times in the next week. They were really dedicated to making sure that they had an impact for their students. Their dedication paid off because this is what the profile of the student looked afterwards. The new bar that you see is the average or is the individual student's cognitive ability after that time in Brainware, after that 12 week dedication to using this software. And what you can see is almost a six year, on average, a six year improvement for these kids. So they started out almost three years behind on average, and at the end of it, after just three months, they were almost three years on average ahead of their age. For these kids, this was life-changing for many of them. They, many of them moved on into a class. They became into the scholars program and became kids that actually wanted to be able to do something. Another example that I have is from some Dibbles assessments, and you can say what you want about Dibbles, but it does have a purpose, and it does show some things when it is done properly. It does give you a good idea of how well the students are reading orally out loud. And so the um, idea here was to look at the third and fourth grade Dibbles oral reading fluency assessment for students that use Brainware in the spring of their third grade, and let's see what happened. And the title of the slide actually gives away the punchline a little bit, but here's the, here's the graph. On average, what you see here is you see the third grade and then the fourth grade. These are the same students. We're comparing the same group of students that, that um, worked in Brainware between the beginning of the year assessment and the end of the year assessment. So that's why you see that orange arrow there pointing at the edge of that 80. And what you see is the average words per minute these third graders were reading when they started their third grade year. And then they used Brainware in the spring and they were tested again and they did increase quite a lot actually, but they still didn't catch up to their peers. The little, uh, what looks like a traditional error bar, that is what the benchmark expectation was. So they were still behind. They were behind 30, or 22 words per minute in the fall, and they didn't gain anything in that short period of time using Brainware in just that spring semester. You didn't see a huge impact. Here's where the impact happened. Look at that fourth grade year, the same students. First off, um, there's an expectation that oral reading fluency falls off over the summer, um, and there's lots of theories as to why, but the expectation is they can read 17 words per minute less when they come back in the fall of fourth grade versus when they are starting in the third grade. Part of that is the material is a little bit difficult, but it is a drop off. And for these students, they decrease less than that. They only decrease, decrease 10 words per minute. The other thing that was really kind of fun was you can see that the average increase over the, the school year in the fourth grade was higher than expected. In other words, they closed that gap. They increased 36 words per minute when what was expected was 25. So they were still behind, but when they started out in the fall of fourth grade, they were behind 23 words per minute. By the spring of their fourth grade, they were behind only by 12 words per minute. So sometimes, after you get these brain structures working right, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to see the impact, but you can see how these kids started to catch up. Then we have one more example, and this is a school that was um, a Title I school, third, fourth, and fifth graders, this is just a sampling of those particular fifth graders. We used the Woodcock-Johnson subtest for this random sample and the Kansas State test for all of them. They were a school in Topeka. And what you see here is the cognitive improvement between the time when they started school and then halfway through the year, and they did brainware between those times. 
And what you can see is the fact that the um, students, and let's see if it's, there we go, you can see the fall, which is the first bar, and the um, yellow, the second bar is yellow, and that's their winter score. And you can see their cognitive improvement. These kids increased um, one year, 10 months, uh, on average, on these particular Woodcock-Johnson tests, which was about the same as published control as a published study group that had been previously done, and better than the four months improvement for the control group that was in the published study. So you can see some significant impact on those particular cognitive improvements. Well, what about their state tests? Well, we looked at the state tests, and what we could see here is that in both math and reading, they actually um, changed quite a bit. The reading score in particular, the math, the math, these students were already above average in math, um, and they did increase their score for all of them. But the really outstanding thing here is looking at the reading. The average score in the third, fourth, and fifth grade the year before they did Brainware was below the standard average. The year after they did Brainware, they were above the, sta the standard average. So there was a huge impact for these particular students on their state scores in addition to what was seen in their cognitive development. So the next group, um, we're actually going now to shift our attention. And for those of you who are actually paying attention, the pun was intended, um, to some of the cognitive skills that underlie language acquisition, uh, particularly for our English language learners. Now what I've done here is single out a couple of skills. Um, these are not the only ones that are related, but I, it's, I think it's sort of helpful to take a little look and see how these would play into language acquisition. And this is a, an area that's very near and dear to my heart as a former foreign language teacher. They called it foreign language. I think they call it world language now. But the point is, anytime we're trying to learn another language, um, actually it's some of the principles apply also in our initial language. But um, And I can promise you that back when I was teaching um, in the dark ages, uh, at least when I was teaching French and Russian, no one really understood, I didn't understand, and no one I knew did, about the importance of cognitive functions and how the brain actually acquires language. Um, in fact, I took the philosophy of language, I took the psychology of language, I took linguistics, and none of them actually had um, any real information. It took um, a couple of decades and some good neuroscientists to get us to this point. So the first one I want to do, the, the Two that I'm going to t we're going to take a little bit of a look at are selective attention and working memory. And um, an example of selective attention is when we have to inhibit word candidates. So um, when we are trying to express something, um, the whole bunch of things might pop into our minds while we're speaking. So here's an example. We have an object in mind. In this case, it is a chair. And that might suggest several words. We're just, if we're just thinking of the idea or the concept or a picture of it or it's in front of us and we want to talk about it, that image may suggest several word can candidates. Um, the Spanish word silla or asiento might be candidates. Chair and seat might be candidates in English. And being able to selectively, attention, uh, select selectively focus our attention on the English word we want to use is of what that skill is all about. And those are things that we don't really control consciously. Um, we just can get better at doing them um, with some practice. Um, the other example I wanted to talk about is working memory and comprehension. And there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done on this in recent years. But here's an example um, that I just made up, but that I think sort of makes the point that when we're listening to a foreign language or another language that isn't our native language, um, it can sound pretty complicated because what we're trying to do is to interpret initially when we're learning it, we're doing a lot of translating back and forth. And that takes even more working memory. So if we think about the sentence, and I'm, I'm going to read it because it's one of those sentences that's not really a great English sentence, but it is a grammatically correct English sentence, I believe. John, who was made fun of by the girl who was kissed by the chimpanzee, came to visit my grandmother yesterday. 
And so we can follow that. We can make sense of it. Most people who speak English can probably do that. But when we're doing that in another language, it becomes much more complicated. We have to keep track of a whole lot of things. We have to figure out who kissed uh, who, um, who is made fun of, and it gets um, an, uh, an extra burden for English language learners. So what we have to do, and then, then imagine we can't remember what a couple of the words mean. Maybe we don't know the word kiss. Maybe we can't remember exactly, or we don't have never learned the word chimpanzee. So what we're trying to do is to hold the whole rest of the structure and the meaning. So we might get John, who is made fun of by the, okay, so John is being made fun of, but then we have to hold in the mind the girl and relate that while we're trying to search our memory banks for the terms kiss or the term chimpanzee, or we're trying to guess it from the context, and then we have to put that all back together again. So um, that's something that requires actually quite a lot of working memory, um, which is uh, pretty critical in this situation. And what we see with English language learners um, is that helping them develop the cognitive abilities like selective attention and working memory can also help them accelerate their academic performance and their language acquisition. And now Sarah is going to share with you a little bit of information on some research that showed that. We had a group in Hammond that was interested in helping their all-day ELL students, sixth through ninth grade, try and make up the fact that they were really struggling with achieving that academic potential that was expected of them. And so they used brainware for eight weeks, four times a week. And what you see is the fact that what happens with these students is it's a bilingual program, but they're in um, all day because they aren't quite good, good enough for their English language to be able to make it in the regular classroom. So these were a group of 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth graders. And the test that was used was SRI reading. The district at this time, I don't know if they still do it at this time, but the district at that time requires the um, 250 lexile growth in one school year for the students in order to be attaining at the expected rate. And there, each grade has a different benchmark for being at risk and basic, basic proficient, advanced, like, like they should based on their lexile points. One of the things that the, that, the, that the people in the bilingual program stressed to me was this is a very hard test for these students because there's no visual cue for them. There's no pictures that go with it. It is just straight text. So if they're struggling with things that Betsy has mentioned, like grabbing the right English word for chair or having a problem remembering what a chimpanzee is, then it really can be something that really tests their ability in a, in a different way than it does for the English students. We assessed cognitive growth in using a behavioral rating scale, asking the teachers, the people that knew the students really well, to comment on things that they had had noticed that changed for these students in such a short period of time. And it, these are the kinds of things we always ask. And the kinds of things that really make a huge difference when you're talking in a classroom, regardless of whether it is a typical student or it is one of the struggling students or it's one of the super group. Um, this is all about your self-confidence matters when you're trying to do your work, your memory, your ability to visualize, how easily you're distracted, and we know all of us are distracted a little bit more at some times than others. All those kinds of things really make a huge difference, but they're manifested by the way that our brains are actually working. So by having a better neural network working, then some of these things are observed and easily to see. In this group, the top areas of improvement were things that noted by all their classes on all 14 behaviors, but these were the top four. They had a higher desire to put in some effort, and think about it, these being middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. These are kids that, that have been really struggling for a while, and so they are starting to give up. So seeing them put in more effort was a good thing. Attention span, a better attention span, better ability to follow directions, better ability to visualize. Those were all things the teachers noted right off the bat about all of their students. So what you're going to see here is some SRI 
data, some Lexile scores for the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th. Now, I just want to explain this a little bit. It looks a little bit confusing, but what you see is the, the center bar, which is yellow on my screen, kind of an off orange kind of yellow, is what the average score, the average Lexile score for these ELL students was in each of those grades. We clumped eighth and ninth together because I think there was only one ninth grader and their, their expectation was about the same. So what you see there is what the average score is and then the yellow line is the trend line of how these students are performing. If you're looking at the lines, the top line that's going across labeled proficient is where they needed to be to be viewed as being able to handle the English language just like a regular English language learner, um, a regular person that grew up with the English language. And the brown bar is basic. So they were just above basic or just below basic in, in what they were doing. And then the bars beside each gives you an idea of the range here for this group of their minimum and maximum scores that were in each of those grades. So there's some significant differences even among these students. Now, they, this was the second trimester before they used Brainware. They then used Brainware in a very intense and put off doing the final test as close to the end as they could. And what you see here is the biggest difference. Look at the yellow bar, the one in the center for each of the groups. You can see that all of them increased and you can see that trend line, the trajectory changed. They're starting, it's changed. It's now no longer going at the same at the same slope as the basic line. It's actually starting to poke up toward the proficient. So we're having a benefit for these students right away. And you can notice that the the minimum and maximum scores changed a little bit. But the important thing here is that a higher percentage of the students increased their scores in the third trimester than in the second trimester. So there's definitely something going on even when it is um, really close to when they finish their cognitive development. Now we're going to move on to um, students with disabilities and I'll let Betsy get this one started again. Great. Okay, so that's the, in fact the group we're going to be looking at and what we're seeing here is the percentage of the IDA, IDEA population that is accounted for by different kinds of um, disabilities. And the largest proportion of the students, um, it's, I think it's about 40%, it depends on the age, um, of these um, students with disabilities are students with specific learning disabilities, which of course means that they have been identified as having an issue with some underlying uh, psychological process, some underlying cognitive process that is standing in the way of their making progress. But there are um, certainly students in some of these other categories that we can also uh, pretty readily recognize as having some underlying cognitive deficits. Um, those with speech and language, uh, intellectual disabilities, autism, developmental delays, um, so, and sometimes um, Cognitive deficits can be comorbid with other kinds of disabilities, so we we definitely see that in you know a large proportion of this population. And if we think about the role that these um, skills play relative to reading and to math, I think it really sort of starts to help point out why many of these students struggle with their academic progress. As educators, we usually think of the basics of reading as being decoding, influency, and comprehension. Um, and but when we take a deeper look, we'll see that there, uh, it's the story is a little bit more complex than that. There is, in fact, no decoding part of our brain. There's no fluency part of our brain. What these require is a whole bunch of things to be happening in our brains at the same time. So, for example, the ability to sustain our attention is essential to decoding. Our, vis our ability to visually discriminate or auditorily discriminate is part of our ability to decode. Sequential processing, keeping things in the right order, whether it's letters or words or lines of print or whatever it happens to be. So if there are deficits in any of those areas, it can certainly slow down the process of decoding. When it comes to fluency, um, there are a whole 
um, additional set of skills that can play a role here, um, some of the same ones, but also if we think about things like visual span, which is how much information we can take in at a glance. If we're taking more information in at a, a single glance, we're going to be able to move along a little faster and therefore hopefully become a little more fluent. Our processing speed. Uh, many of these students have issues in processing speed, um, in attention, uh, and then, of course, in executive functions, which really come into play, and working memory, which come into play a lot in comprehension. There's a lot of research that has shown that visualization, working memory, and executive functions are really essential in comprehension. So being able, for example, to visualize a scene that we're seeing, being able to hold on to the information at the beginning of the paragraph until we get to the end of the paragraph. The example that I gave you from the ELL student trying to understand about John and the girl and the chimpanzee and grandmother and all that. So those are examples of how working memory plays in. And these are often some areas, especially attention, especially processing speed, and working memory that have are commonly found to be deficits in students with disabilities, and spe especially students with specific learning disabilities. And we can move on to math and basically see some of the same kinds of things going on. Uh, when it comes to representing spatial information, something we do a lot in math, then our ability to visualize, to understand directionality. So directionality, I probably should be a little bit more specific about that, is the ability to um, not just know your left from your right, but being able to project that onto other objects in space. So if we think about that as seeing um, a table that has been flipped or numbers that have been flipped or isomers of the, a, a molecule in chemistry, all of those kinds of things require us to be able to manipulate information in space. Um, and then not necessarily spatial, but other kinds of uh, information manipulation are also key in in math. Um, and uh, here, working memory, attention, sequential processing, and processing speed all come in into play. And if we think about, for example, um, um, trying to solve a story problem, and I hear lots of teachers who talk about the fact that their students, um, by the time they figure out what's involved in the equation that they need to solve in the problem, have completely lost track of the problem themselves, so that it um, they really can't hold that, and that's an issue of working memory um, and also of um, sequential and simultaneous processing in many situations. And then ultimately, um, of course, reasoning and logic and executive functions um, also in enter in here. And as we said before, executive functions can be particularly an area that is weak for these students. And so what Sarah is going to share with you now is research done by another Sarah, um, who um, did a specific a study specifically with students with specific learning disabilities. Say that three times fast. Yeah, I, I, re I really should have left the first specific out at least. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, though, that I'm always intrigued by every time we look at these slides of the cognitive processes with reading and math is, is the relationship between the two. And many times people think about them being such different uh, contextually so different in what you're learning, but yet they're really relying on some of the same kinds of brain processes in order for us to be able to do them. And it's just totally intriguing to me. But one of the things that, that uh, we have is some new research this year that was done by a different Sarah. Uh, Dr. I'm going to say her name wrong, Asaton, I might have gotten it close, um, <laughs> that really worked on um, wanting to find out how students in grades two through four that were diagnosed by their schools as having specific learning disabilities, how they could be impacted at that age and, and what it meant, and using Brainware as the, as the um, intervention. So she had a control group and a study group. They were randomly um, generated within, within two different schools, and what they had was um, you know, similar kind of demographics, that kind of thing. And she pre and post tested them with some of the tests of the Woodcock Johnson cognitive battery and also some of the tests of academic achievement, reading fluency, math fluency, those kinds of things. And what you see here is, is the general intellectual ability, reading 
scores and math scores. But these aren't age equivalent like you saw previously. These are the relative proficiency index, which is a calculated score from their, from their score on the test. And it actually gives you a nice way to compare how these students would be performing compared to the typical student in their class, meaning that the, the relative probability that a student would be able to perform the task correctly is at 90%. 90% success is what really you're looking for to say this is a typically performing student. So you can see that 90 bar up at the top, and that's, that's where we're trying to get these students. So the first set of bars is the control group, and the second set of bars is the study group. I try not to describe by color. I have two screens here, and there are two different colors here, let alone people that are colorblind. So the thing to, to keep track of here is the pre is always in front and then the post. So you can see that the students that were in control group, the general intellectual ability, the reading and the math, their RPI did not change very much regardless in the same period of time, in a 12-week in a period. Going through school, going through their regular intervention, they had the same things going on as their study group counterparts, except their study group counterparts also was, were doing brainware. And you can see the big difference here in those particular students and how they grew, where for their general intellectual ability, they almost hit that 90%. And I, and I know that Sarah wants to go back and test them again now after, after it's been almost a year to see how, how they're doing, and we're looking forward to that opportunity to do that. And then we have the reading scores, where we have, um, the again, not much change for the control group, but yet the study group went from around 35% RPI to almost 70% RPI. In math, they were doing much better. And you can see, though, that there's still a huge increase, and they got much closer to their average student in their classroom, in their ability. Then Dr. Avaton also looked at their cognitive processes by, by trying to dig a little bit deeper, and how were these affected? And these were the things we were just talking about looking at their executive functions and their visual working memory, their processing speeds, their auditory processing, and their broad attention. And I'm not going to point them all out. You can see them there. It looks a little bit crowded in there, but you get the idea there. You can see the, you can see the dramatic increase for that study group, that last bar in each of those groups, compared to the second bar, which is the post-test for the control group, and how different they are. And you can see how close, and actually how some of them in some of those areas went past that 90% mark, which is extremely exciting for all of us because we know that they definitely had an impact on the function of those kids. And we can only um, imagine how much easier things are for them now and, and um, hope that this really has a big impact on their success in their life. So those are some of the things about these particular students that are historically behind. And we use the word historically um, really on purpose because it is something that has been happening for years and years and years and everybody in special ed knew it but it wasn't until the change in the state report cards that it became so evident to so many other people and it really now is highlighted that that just getting there with with a certain group of students isn't enough you need to also try and help all of the others too I think another thing, and I know Dr. Aston would say this um, if she were participating, and she actually did do a, um, a much more in-depth webinar where she presented this, and it's available on our website if that's of interest to people who want to get into this in a little bit more detail. Um, but, you know, what we have done um, traditionally in education is uh, provide workarounds, accommodations, extra support, more time on task and those kinds of things for the students who are struggling, particularly um, in the uh, kids with spe specific learning dif disabilities. Um, but, and, and what this suggests is that, you know, we're still going to do those things that kids still need that kind of support, but we also need to be looking at remediating those underlying issues because if we can, then they're going to be able to really accelerate uh, their progress and and when we and it makes sense because if we say that these are the mental processes that are not working as efficiently as they should be and that those are the things that are standing in the way of their academic gains, then when we remedy them, we should in fact see those dramatic growth spurts in their 
academic skills. And so it's um, exciting and uh, very hopeful in many ways to be able to see that kind of uh, improvement. That's what is so exciting about the way she did her research, where she had them doing their intervention and then having added a, pro a program that was to, that is designed to develop those underlying processes. So they're doing that in their intervention, and the impact is just tremendous. So I think we've gotten to the point where we actually have um, some time for questions and comments and thoughts. And anybody thought have thoughts that they'd like to share with us? And so, as Sarah suggested earlier, if you have a question you would like us to try to adjust, address, we would be delighted to do that. And you can just type it in on the chat window, which is either to the right or near the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can do it to either the host or the host and the presenter. Um, that way we'll see it. I, right now there isn't any. Did you um, want to pull some from the... Um, Sure, we can do that. We, we do about. have um, people who submit questions when they register, and hopefully some of them are on the the webinar today. Um, and I, there were some really intriguing questions, and Sarah and I have not rehearsed this. I just pulled them right before the <laughs> uh, the webinar. So, you know, we, may, we might each have some different takes on a couple of these things. But one of the questions was, how do you assist teachers in taking ownership of teaching all of our students? And I mm -hmm. thought that was... Uh, a really provocative and interesting question. So, Sarah, you want to? Do you have any thoughts on that? And I'll offer some. Um, you know, that's always something that that when I was teaching, Betsy and I are both recovering um, academics, as we like to say. And um, when I was teaching, that was always something I was trying to get through to my colleagues was that you need to take ownership for everybody in the room. It's not just whether you presented the material in the right way, it's how many of them got it and what can you do for the ones that don't. And sometimes it's hard to get through to them until, until it really makes a big point. But I think that eventually everybody will get there. In the, and and I, honestly, I know that they're pretty controversial, but I actually like the report cards for that reason because I think it's really going to make people sit up and listen and go, oh, wait a minute, we do have to worry about everybody. I think another way, because I, th I like the way the question was phrased in terms of assisting teachers. And one of the things that we see is that um, teachers sometimes um, struggle because they think, oh, I can't teach to everybody. Um, but they also don't have a really good understanding necessarily of what's happening and that the process of learning in the brain is actually a biological process and that when they start to appreciate that different brains work a little differently because of the experience they've had, because that it's not, that it's not a child um, just being um, oppositional necessarily. It's not just that they weren't paying attention or were just being difficult, but sometimes that there are underlying processes that can be helped, um, but that nonetheless are getting in their way. That is the kind of thing that starts to help. I think we also see when they start to understand how the brain learns and some of the good practices um, that are really brain compatible in a classroom, that that starts to get through also to many students. So you may be dealing with it, but, but you're allowing different students to elaborate and work with the material to really interact with it in different ways and to hook it into their own experience. And we see that really working. We, we, um, Sarah and I are currently working with a wonderful school that has um, a lot of students. In fact, all of their students are from um, very difficult backgrounds and um, with a lot of issues, family issues and economic issues. And one of the topics that we're currently exploring with the teachers there is what we talk about as being prior knowledge. And when we started to talk about how you plan a lesson, how you uh, it, that understanding where students are in terms of their prior knowledge and prior beliefs is really important because you have to get them from wherever they are to where you want to get them. And trying to figure out how to sort of close the gaps 
in this sense in terms of some of their experiences so that they can do it. So I would think that um, really helping teachers to understand, and there's some wonderful books to start with, um, and we can include some of those if people are interested, but I think those are the kinds of things that really empower teachers to try to teach to everybody and to be more involved um, and to let the students be more involved. And are any other questions popping up, Sarah? There are. Um, we have some that um, is I'm trying to I'm trying to scroll up. I need to make my window bigger. They're coming in fast and furious. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one person commented that um, it reminds us that we must remediate the right things, which are cognitive deficits. And she, she thinks that general education teachers feel that they're not equipped to differentiate this way. Um, and it, it appears that maybe a program um, could be helpful. And actually, I, to bounce off from that, that fits really well with what you were saying. And, and also both of our experience, not just with um, the school we're currently working with, but in my past life teaching chemistry and trying to get my colleagues to realize that um, just teaching watered down chemistry to the people that don't care about science isn't going to get them interested or make them understand why they should be interested. And so it's really about um, comfort level for the teachers. And I think we forget to support them. I think we forget that, that sometimes maybe it's that they're, they're feeling a little bit like they don't understand it either. And they don't know how to find what that particular um, prior knowledge is and how do they do that. So offering as many opportunities to get that kind of information from the variety of sources that are out there are, are really valuable. I think also, Sarah, that you know the, the comment about cognitive skills and what teachers can and can't do in the classroom is really relevant. Because what we know about developing cognitive skills is it requires a number of things, one of which is a lot of intensity and repetition. Uh, which is what the Brainware program actually accomplishes, which is very difficult because you also have the situation that every brain in that classroom is a little bit different. Everybody's cognitive strengths and cognitive weaknesses are different. And so it's, it is true that that would be virtually impossible for a teacher to be able to develop in their students. And so having a program that can do that and get them to the classroom much more prepared to learn and more you know, able to hold the problem in their working memory and think about things, being able to make more progress in their reading, be able to actually start to think at higher levels. So this all plays into Common Core as well, which I know a lot of our educators are dealing with these days. Um, we do have a question that we get often, and um, I'm going to, I'll read the question, I'll let you respond. Um, and it's, do you have any data on sustainability or longevity of cognitive improvements as well as the impact of brainware on disconnected youth? And although I do know that answer, I'm going to stop sharing my <laughs> desktop and let you answer it. Oh, oh okay. Um, we actually do have data, um, and we also have theory that supports the fact that the gains are sustained. And let me talk about it both ways. So the um, actually, Sarah, I know you just unshared your desktop, but is it yeah. possible that you could reshare your, the Ross data? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking <laughs> that after I was unsharing it. So let okay, me, so let me share one of it. the one of the um, <laughs> studies that Sarah shared with you a little bit earlier was on um, improvements uh, among Title I students, and um, where you saw some uh, almost a two-year. Um, gain on the particular exactly. tests that they had taken, which was comparable to what we'd seen in, in other published, um, and actually in a variety of studies at this point. And what we saw, because these students were then tested again about five months after the post-test, and I don't we think we have that chart in this presentation, but we can certainly send it around, and maybe we'll add that before we send this uh, presentation out, is that most of the students five months later were, had grown even beyond where they were on this chart. So they had con continued to improve their cognitive ability at an accelerated rate. 
And there were a couple that hadn't done that, but nobody went anywhere near back to where they had started. So one of the ways to think about this is that what we're trying to do in developing cognitive skills is get them to the level where they are automatic, where we no longer have to think about them. And if we think about the things that we have all learned to do that we no longer have to think about, like tie our shoes or ride a bike or drive a car or walk, those are things that we don't think about anymore. We do them all the time. Those are skills that are there to be used, and especially when we're talking about these cognitive processes that are so essential to learning, once we have them and we're actually using them, oh, my gosh, you're just magic. Okay, so you can see <laughs> where they were in the uh, in the final just before the end of the year where um, they all, uh, almost all of them continued to increase. Um, a couple went, lost a little bit, but basically um, everybody retained or um, continued to grow. So... Um, those are skills that, you know, when we're using them all the time, so we use our selective attention, we use our working memory, we use our auditory processing and our processing speed. And the more we practice that, when we have them there, and we, and one of the things that we do see is because we're seeing this transfer to the academic, that as we use then our academic skills and continue to make progress there, that reinforces and gives us more practice on those cognitive areas. So it makes sense both from a theoretical standpoint as well as from the data. Now, um, it'll be really interesting um, to see it when we go th past and even longer time frames, and um, that's work that we have ongoing right even today. It is, it is one of the hardest things to get in, in research is the longevity data, and we get asked it a lot. Um, especially with the kind of because we are groundbreaking and doing things in a way that isn't normally done, we do get asked a lot, and and it's it's one of those things that that is very hard for for anybody to do because I mean I don't know how many times I've had schools get started on brainware and almost half the classroom changes um, in the middle of the whole process because of the timing of when they of when they start and all of that kind of stuff. Kids come in and out of the districts, and it's that makes it very hard to get any kind of real lasting results. Were there other questions that you had on your list or um, that are coming from our participants? Let's see. While you're looking, I will um, add one question that came from somebody who um, registered, which had to do with strengthening cognitive skills to get IQ into the normal range. And... Um, and that's a really interesting um, situation as well. The program has actually been used in some special schools with students with um, IQs in the 60 to 80 range. Um, and what they saw was they did, in fact, make progress. I think that I can't remember whether it actually got them. It may have gotten some um they, there certainly were improvements. There was that what they saw over the course of the year of the school year was about nine months of improvement with those students, where typically they weren't seeing virtually any uh, cognitive improvement over the course of the year. So I don't think there's a guarantee we'll get everybody up into the normal range. I think it is very feasible um, for this to help students, um, some students, uh, achieve that goal. I think we're probably running um, close to the end of our time here. Um, most of the questions are things that we can handle um, offline. Okay, great. Well, then I guess what's left is just to say thank you again to everybody for joining us today. We hope you found this useful and helpful. We hope to see you sometime at our next um, Neuroscience and Education webinar. We're cooking a few things up right now and um, hopefully be announcing those fairly soon. So we... Um, we really were, appreciate your, your time today, and um, we will look forward to talking to you all again soon. Thanks, everybody. Day, everyone.